Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Junaid, and uh, uh, I am a geoinformatics engineer, uh, currently working as the geospatial database developer for uh, mapping archaeological heritage in South Asia project. Uh, so in this session, I'm going to be talking about some of the open source technologies that we are using um, and the steps that we have taken to make the whole process more sustainable. <clears throat> so uh, starting with the introduction to the pro uh, project, um, Mapping Archaeological Heritage in South Asia project is mainly based at the University of Cambridge. Uh, it is funded by uh, Arcadia and uh, it mainly focuses on the uh, documentation of endangered archaeology and cultural heritage of Indus River Basin. Uh, so it makes most parts of Pakistan and some parts, uh, parts of Northwest India. Um, so all the data that is being documented will be made access, uh, available through an open access uh, online database. Uh, while it's open access, but it will still have variable level of access depending on the user roles because it's uh, uh, the heritage data is quite sensitive in terms of value and preservation. Um, so this uh, online database is being developed using Arches platform. Uh, this uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot more detail about Arches in the next few slides. Um, so the aim of this uh, database is to provide an open access mapping resource and research repository, uh, which is a collaborative research output with the local uh, heritage professionals. We have collaboration in both Pakistan and India uh, with the academic and both at the government level. Um, so, and the project has a built in uh, uh, series of training programs for the capacity building um, uh, of, the, of the stakeholders. Um, uh, so, uh, talking about the data sources that we are using to document all this archaeological heritage, one of the main data source is historical maps. Uh, so, we are using Survey of India maps that uh, were developed as part of Britain's colonial presence in the South Asia. Um, so, these these maps have uh, actually, uh, from early nine, uh, 1900s, uh, have proved to be a very rich source of archaeological sites. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the importance of these maps is that uh, these predate most of the urban and agricultural expansion because a lot of urban expansion and use uh, agriculture expansion has uh, resulted in loss of archaeological sites. So this, these historical maps predate that and uh, has, they are proving to be a great source of that information. Uh, so the way we are doing is that we are getting the high resolution scans from the uh, libraries. Uh, and then doing a georeferencing on it. Uh, over here, you can see a map that shows you uh, mainly two, three colors. The green ones are the maps that have already been georeferenced. So it's a very uh, good coverage of the uh, study area. And then the yellow ones are that have been scanned and the red ones are that are currently being georeferenced. So this is a live map that you can also find uh, on the uh, official website for the project. Um, another source that we are using is the legacy data. So all the publication and books uh, that are uh, in, in digital or non-digital format are uh, getting documented in a structured format. Uh, then the remote sensing, we are using uh, Google Earth imagery and along with some of the uh, old Corona Im satellite imagery uh, from 1970s. Uh, the project is also doing field surveys uh, to ground truth the data. Uh, that is available from other sources or collect new one. Um, adding to this is uh, another uh, data source, which is uh, basically machine learning. It is based on the historic maps. So one way to deal with this was to georeference the historic maps and then manually go uh, and look at all those archaeological sites and then digitize them. But uh, in this process, in this process, uh, we have a team, uh, some uh, partners who are working to automate this process, who have worked to automate this process using machine learning. So uh, in the uh, uh, bottom, uh, you can see that these archaeological sites or mound features have specific visualization on the map sheets. Uh, so the machine learning algorithm is trained on these, uh, uh, these representations. Uh, and then it uh, uh, runs on the bulk of map sheets to generate an, uh, a spatial output. Over here, you can see uh, the result of one of the uh, runs. Um, and uh, as we add more maps to it, it's a matter of minutes that it will detect all those archaeological sites in a very quick way. Uh, so this data, uh, because you can see there are a lot of sources from where the data is flowing in, it all gets collated into Arches database platform um uh, so arches is a very rich and uh, feature rich platform but it's also 
a bit it can get a bit complex to deal with so it's a open source web based geospatial information system that is specifically designed for cultural heritage inventory and management uh, it's developed by the getty conservation institute and world monuments fund um, on the right side you can see the image for the search page of ours is uh, so you have an op you have options for spatial or non spatial search deal with the uh, map canvas do advanced search using operators based on the data type or specific attributes um, download the data if you have right uh, and more um, so the standards that archis uses to uh, have this data are based on cydoc crm ontologies cydoc basically provides you a conceptual reference framework to uh, manage uh, cultural heritage data um, so in archis you can define your data structure where will you you can use the specific classes from cydoc um, and assign it to your um, uh, nodes or attributes um, this uh, this is all done using a special graph structure that is referred to as resource models um, a resource model uh, can be seen in this image over here that it, uh, it it is a list that comprises of nodes and branches nodes can be thought of individual attributes and then branches can be thought of as a group of attributes for example a name name is a node and uh, if you think of the whole name branch name and name type uh, together they become a branch and it can be visualized in a graph structure over here uh, in this way a benefit of this graph structure is that you can configure some of the branches to allow multiple instances for example if you configure the name branch to be multiple then one side can have more than one names mm -hmm. which can be categorized into primary names or alternate names uh, uh, depending on the data set um, and it offers a number of data types uh, like for uh, to assign to your nodes or attributes which include uh, numbers strings um, extended data formats uh, or uh, one of the very uh, interesting ones is the concept that is basically control vocabularies uh, so any any attribute that you don't want to have just simple text or you want to control it with specific terms for the uh, eventual benefit of clean search or standardized data uh, development you can assign the concept data type to that particular attribute um, it can be translated to control vocabularies um, for example um, like in the in the ground geomet geometry recording method you only allow the users to enter uh, values like ground truthing legacy data or remote sensing nothing open so that the search is clean and all all those functionalities um, and a powerful thing about this concept data type is that it can also be hierarchical. Um, like there is a parent and then it has some children. For example, in the top right, you can see that uh, ground truthing is a concept and a geometry recording method, but it has further children, which include handle GPS, phone, tablet, built in GPS, or total station. And the system is intelligent enough if you will search it for total station, um, it will give you very specific result. But if you just filter the record for ground truthing it would also pull in all the child records which have values for handle gps or others so that you can give a full picture um arches also allows you to um uh, relate different resources with one another in the database and it you can actually read across the resources for example uh, in the middle the red one is a historic map which is associated with three resources and if you look at the side side panel and the report page then it you can actually say that this punjab map has been georeferenced the activity has carried out by jack tomini the right is held by cambridge university library and the survey activity was, uh, was done by mr eo wheeler um so uh, as you can see it's a quite rich platform um, but we have come across a number of challenges that we are i'm going to explain in next few slides so um there is a capability like because resource models are totally customizable depending on your requirement arches does allow you to go into a number of nesting levels um, and as you increase the number of nesting levels the data structure gets more and more complicated and it becomes a bit more complicated to push data into arches um, for example uh, but there are genuine use cases that require you to have that sort of complex structure for example one heritage site can have multiple condition assessments associated with it uh, then at, at different points in time and then each condition assessment can have more than one disturbances or risks or threats associated with it so it 
it uh, if you start going into deeper level of nesting um, the data import becomes quite difficult and this was one of the major challenges that uh, we faced we were faced with when we started the project back in october uh, like towards end of 2020 um, and at that time there was really no provision to import this data without getting a very complex json object um, uh, which had its own uh, specific format and all that. Um, so to deal with this multiple uh, attributes, Arches recommends a specific type of data format. If you see it in the tabular or the CSV format, you have to use a multiple row, row structure. Uh, for example, you would make the common resource IDs uh, to tell Arches that it's the data for the same resource, but then you will use multiple rows to specify the other in the uh, example at the bottom, you can see that uh, side number two has more than one name, uh, Mohammadi Derai primary name and Hazana Derai alternate name. So you just simply made two, two rows for it. But what if you had a site that had two condition assessment and each condition assessment would, would have more than one disturbance effect. Like you can imagine that the file would start getting very complex. You would have to go into the sheets and all that. Um, so this was a major uh, challenge to us and uh, uh, we had been talking to the uh, larger Arches community and the, uh, the team that is de developing most of the features uh, Arches, that's uh, file launcher graphics. Uh, and since then there have been a number of releases for the software. Um, um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I'll just talk a bit more about the data structure. Um, so uh, we had to use this data structure anyway because it has its own advantages. Um, for example, uh, in the uh, study area that we are working with, there are challenges like uh, provision of internet or uh, working in uh, uh, an offline environment. So we did make a uh, formatted CSV file structure on top of the recommendation that Archis gives. Um, so it has uh, it's a very colorful Excel sheet that you can work with. Um, it has uh, indicates uh, that whether the attribute is allowed for multiples or not, then it indicates the data type, uh, which is the concept or string, then the name of the attribute. Um, you have drop down for control vocabularies um, to avoid any mistakes. Um, uh, then colored columns too for easy identification of the group of attributes like site name or the assessment activities. And then unique MASA IDs that you have seen in the previous example, you need that MASA uh, unique ID so that Arches knows these all attributes are associated with the one site. Um, but still, uh, whether uh, where we could not totally get rid of this format, we needed to have something more sophisticated to bring it into Arches. And that's what we had been talking about with different uh, other uh, Arcadia funded projects and the company responsible for development of Arches. And uh, since uh, uh, 20, uh, late 2020, there have been a number of releases uh, which can be seen over here. Now it's been very interesting to keep on uh, updating the instance, but uh, you can see that it's been over 20, 18 new releases since then. And one of the two major releases uh, that are particularly interesting were uh, the version six basically that leaves a new method to import data into Arches using the relational or uh, schema or SQL ETL methods, which would deal with the complexity of this nested uh, um, data structure. And in version seven, um, there was a release that had internationalization capability. So you can translate the whole uh, platform, both static uh, labels and the dynamic data into local languages, for example, two of the main languages that we are working with are Urdu and Hindi. Um, so uh, we started to study this SQL ETL methods or relational schema to get more understanding how we can get data into Arches. And uh, relational schema basically converts your whole graph data structure into a standard Postgres relational database. Um, you have uh, SQL function over here that's the Arches created source model views. Um, and uh, uh, you give it uh, the unique universal ID of the graph and uh, it will convert it into views. So you can see that uh, our main resource model, that's uh, heritage location, it got converted into 44 views um, over here. Um, so when we got the understanding of this new uh, venues were open. So we thought why not to improve the whole data digitization process 
which is solely based on the CSV files. Maybe we, because this is all geospatial data, maybe we can define the whole pipeline. So we, uh, when we got more familiar with this and got more control over the backend, so we started looking into their, that setup. And as a part, part of that, we made a centralized instance of Postgres and some QGIS forms. Um, so setting up the centralized database was that um, we made a copy, sort of a copy of the Arches backend, but uh, a, a bit light. It was a whole, it's a whole relational database with all the attributes field from the respective resource models. Uh, in the Arches relational views, they use a JSON binary structure uh, because they have to cater for the multiple languages that were made available as part of Arches version seven. So in one object, you can save the text for Urdu, English, and Hindi. But for our own case, we kept it light um, and we use simple data types uh, like string to ensure uh, effective communication, uh, secure communication. We configured the SSL for Postgres and then there is an automated backup routine using cron jobs as well. As a front end for this, we decided to make a QGS form. Uh, and to do that, we had to uh, do a number of uh, settings in the QGS project. So first we loaded all the relational tables from the database. Uh, then QGS allows you to discover the relationship based on the primary keys and foreign keys. Um, this is a very nice functionality that Postgres offers you as compared to geo package. Like if you have relations in the geo package, you have to add them one by one. That becomes a bit cumbersome if you have a big, big relational geo package. Um, so this is, uh, this was very good. And then we, you load all the relationships. Then you have to configure the edit settings so that the editing can start on all the related layers at the same time, because you have to enter the data for multiple layers and then save it also in a systematic way so that it does not violate the primary key and foreign key constraints. Um, then we uh, designed a data entry form for it using the standard QGIS widgets, added some user constraints and validations um, to help the users. And then we reduce, we set the layer visibility so that only a subset of layers is available to users because otherwise it's more than 30 tables that can be confusing for the uh, person who is not familiar with the backend. Uh, so the QGIS form looks something like this. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the person responsible for entering the data, the associated mass, mass ID. Then on the top, you can see all the cards available, um, like assessment activity, site name. These are all the branches of the resource model, basically. And because it's a relational database, so you get an edit button for the site itself, and you can add more than one site names as a group. Um, so I would like to call out John who worked on this form and he might be watching online, so that would be good. Um, uh, so yeah, we are now our whole team is uh, uh, working using this uh, uh, QGS form to enter the data. Uh, when this data is available in the centralized instance of Postgres, um, uh, I knew the concept of foreign wrappers. So you, foreign wrappers allow you to access one database into another without the need to create a backup and uh, restoring it into another Postgres instance and then uh, running the queries. So in a live connection, you can create the uh, foreign wrapper for centralized DB into Arch's backend. And then you have to write a lot of SQL queries with <laughs> a lot of functions. But once it's done, it's done. So you can have a live sort of a sync between your CDB and Arches. Um, so here is a example of some of the, uh, some of the SQL queries that you can see um, to push the data. And once that data is pushed into Arches backend, uh, you can just uh, index it to the search um, using some standardized command and it gets available into the uh, interface. So this is the like one of the resource model that has been imported into this uh, uh, this uh, uh, using this this whole pipeline. Um, so it has streamlined the, all of the process that we now have a complex data structure as well. The team can work on a QGS uh, environment because it's spatial data, and then the management and all uh, ingestion has been streamlined. Um, we also have a component for uh, field data collection, as I talked earlier. Um, so Arches initially comes out with, came out with Arches Collector, but because it's the whole open source software and the community 
contributions and all that. So as I mentioned that there have been 18 releases already. So it's a bit variable pace of development for the main software and then the artist collector. Um, uh, so with the recent versions, it's not working very seamlessly. Um, and there is a proposal on updating the technologies, technology stack and uh, making a new version of Arches Collector. Uh, but meanwhile, we had to adopt another open source technology, which is basically ODK. You might have worked with it. Um, so Open Data Kit um, is an open source mobile data collection platform. It has been uh, very useful for our requirements because we have to work in remote areas where sometimes good internet connectivity is not present. So you have to collect data offline, which is allowed by ODK. One of the very interesting um, or useful capability that I can say is that is the preloading of existing data. Um, so uh, because Archis Collector is not there, if it was, then we could have just connected it to the main instance of Archis and then our ground routing. But now we have to preload some of the data into ODK. And when we started working with it, there was no interactive way to do that. And this widget was rolled, I think, some somewhere last year, uh, around that time. So we use this. This needs to be uploaded as CSV file to the server. And from there, you can configure your XLS form to load the data. When you click on it, it will pull up the attributes from the file. And you can see what's the data and collect new data. Um, and it has also allowed a lot of user scalability. Um, because the way the project is set up, we have to do a lot of trainings for local stakeholders in both Pakistan and India. So sometimes it's when it's at university, they bring in a lot of students and uh, because it's a free solution. So we have the provision to scale it up, give accounts to all the students. They can do test run into the field. Um, so it's uh, very scalable in that way. And again, uh, it offers multilingual forms. So uh, you can translate the form into Urdu or Hindi. So we have tried to make the form um useful where possible uh, like uh, with with hints and colors uh because it has some repeat groups embedded in it so the users uh, to make it easy for users we have introduced these images and uh, control vocabulary is the same as the main artist instance for example you can see overall site condition assessment so it has some same control vocabulary that the user can select from um so and yeah this is being used for a number of field seasons um already uh, these are some of the images from field uh, where our team is working with the local uh, people uh, while collecting the data or doing the capacity building. Um, so yeah, really it uh, brings it down to this one slide, like how the data life cycle looks like. It starts with the data sources, uh, historical maps, uh, legacy data, and all that that I've talked about. Then the data development is based on different tools like uh, QGIS, uh, ODK, structured CSV files. We are working collaboratively on SharePoint. There are different quality assurance check points because it's uh, so much data inflowing. Uh, so uh, different research analysts work with different collaborators to ensure the quality of the data. It all gets uh, together in centralized Postgres instance where they are doing day to day working. And then from there, it's pulled into Arches using an automated pipeline that I've just talked about. Um, so we have been like the sustainability of uh, all this process um, has uh, already been improving. Uh, we have uh, a, a new sustainability group that is. Uh, uh, basically a collaborative work uh, group. Uh, we have meetings with multiple Arcadia projects uh, where you can discuss uh, how to keep these things uh, running in the long term. Archies is also a sustainability consultant on board. Um, and there has been much more community engagement using the Archies project community forum. So uh, it's very active. You can get very quick support. And also if you come up with a new solution or you know the problems to others, you can comment over there. Um, finally, I would like to um thank all the partners collaborators and our funder for all the support that they have given um and uh, that's it from my side so you can visit our website for more information thank you uh, we have time for uh, some questions Thank you. That's a really nice project. And 
The Arches site says some of the development supports it by Natural England. Um, is there any use of it that you know here in Scotland? Is this historic environment Scotland ever? Yeah. Um, if I understood, you are asking about Archie's usage in Scotland. So yeah, I, I, there are quite a lot of projects. I, I mean, uh, I don't know about Arcadia funded projects that are spread across the globe, like some are working in Africa, some in South Asia. Then Historic England is also using um, Archie. I'm not 100% sure about the Scotland uses, but on the website, there is a list of all the projects that are and in the recent, recent uh, Okay, they have said that it's more than 100%. Any other questions? All right. Thanks.